Good afternoon. I am Sarah Stoner, an attorney at Eckerd Siemens and chair of the Pennsylvania Bar Association's Public Utility Law Section. The Public Utility Law Section, together with the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project, the Pennsylvania Office of Consumer Advocate, the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network, and the Pennsylvania Bar Association's Pro Bono Office are excited to introduce you to a new pro bono opportunity designed to utilize the expertise of public utility law practitioners to help consumers get answers to their utility related questions. The free legal answers for utility and energy questions project would make members of the Pennsylvania Bar who are well versed in utility and energy law available to customers of PA PUC regulated public utilities to help them understand and identify the resources available to help uh, solve their utility or energy related problems. This CLE will provide information and training related to the project and address some of the ethical issues associated with participating in the program. The Free Legal Answers Program has been endorsed by the Public Utility Law Section, but you do not need to be a member of this section to participate in the program. If you are not a member of this section, I encourage you to consider joining the section. The section offers members valuable benefits, including a monthly legislative report, virtual lunch and learns, meet and greet receptions with commissioners and advocates, and volunteer and leadership opportunities. Please feel free to reach out to me if you are interested in joining the section. To provide some background context, the Public Utility Law Section Council formed a committee uh, led by Mel Elatia to make a recommendation on whether the section should support and participate in the Free Legal Answers Program. The committee met several times and presented its recommendations in support of the program to section members. Section members then voted to uh, recommend to section members and other uh, attorneys that they volunteer for the program that we create and maintain a resource guide to aid participating attorneys and to create a committee to maintain and update that resource guide on a routine basis and to take additional action to further support the program. My colleague, Dan Clearfield, is chair of the recently formed Free Legal Answers Committee. Before I turn the presentation over to Dan, I would like to introduce the speakers participating in today's program. With us today are David Travaskis, PBA Pro Bono Coordinator, Patrick Cicero, Consumer Advocate of Pennsylvania, uh, Dan Clearfield, who is co-chair of Eckerd Siemens Utility and Energy Practice Group, Elizabeth Marks, Executive Director, Pennsylvania Utility Law Project. Uh, Liz has made significant contributions to today's CLE, but is feeling a little under the weather. Uh, John Sweet, who is a senior attorney at the Pennsylvania Utility Law Project, has graciously agreed to cover his part and Liz's part of the presentation. Uh, thank you to all who contributed to the creation of the CLE session. We appreciate all of you who joined this CLE session to learn more about the Free Legal Answers Program. On behalf of the Public Utility Law Section, we hope you enjoy today's CLE and take the opportunity to participate in the program. I'll now turn the presentation over to Dan Clearfield. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. <clears throat> and thank everyone who's uh, participating today and on the program and also who've, who've tuned in. Uh, we really appreciate you taking you know, some time to learn about this. Um, you know, I tend to call a spade a spade and this is a an infomercial right we're we're gonna you know we'd like you to get familiar with this uh this uh pro bono opportunity we we our goal is to get you to sign up uh to help uh in uh giving assistance to customers who might need it um i think it's a great program uh, I think it's a great opportunity to sort of get back uh, and uh, to ex to use our the knowledge we've built up as practitioners in this area. Uh, 
in, 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 a, in a positive way. So uh, let's let's get started. So what is, you know, what is free legal answers? Well, we've been calling free legal answers utilities. <laughs> we've tried, we, we played with other names, but um, the, the, the goal here is to uh, identify the fact that we're using the existing uh, free law, uh, legal answers uh, platform that has existed uh, and that the P uh, PBA has set up, has stood up, is actually the ABA, I think, initially. And the concept is that, that it, it would use this this platform and to uh, to allow volunteers who have expertise in this area or can get or can 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 help uh, uh, you know uh, get that expertise from others to answer you know key questions that consumers have. Uh, we're looking at it as something you know primarily primarily to answer basic questions about how to deal with the utility or energy uh, issue or problem. But in addition, um, we're hoping that it can also be used to help consumers identify uh, low-income energy assistance programs that may be available from uh, the utilities or from state, state, uh, state government, state or federal uh, sources. And to answer questions about them and, and most importantly, uh, help them uh, 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 enroll in those programs. You know, there's a ton of people out there who aren't enrolled these, uh, you know, even though there are, you know, many, many that are. And so e e we, we see this as one way uh, to to help customers do that. Um, the As I said, the, um, the program would use the free legal answers platform. Um, if you haven't signed up for that, um, you know, maybe after the, after this, you can see how that, how that works. You know, you certainly don't have to be committed to it, but it's really easy. You go to PBA free legal answers. There's a link. Um, they, you know, if you're a lawyer, they ask you a couple of basic questions. Like if, um, are, are you a lawyer in good standing? Don't take that as a philosophical question, but a legal, <laughs> a legal question. And you should answer yes. If you, if you satisfy that. And uh, there's a whole series of um, once you're uh, admitted, and I think Dave Dravescus, who's going to talk later, has to sort of just make sure that you actually are a lawyer in Pennsylvania, uh, admitted to the bar. But once that's pretty much the only that's the only test, I think. And there are uh, a number of different areas uh, of questions that you could uh, volunteer to answer. Uh, we've Dave has created a special one just for this project. It's called Residential Utility and Energy Matters, and that's the question. That's the question that we're hoping uh, people will check if they have questions about uh, a PUC, a utility uh, uh, issue, if they're having questions about uh, having you know inability to pay their bill, etc. There's a whole series of other ones if you're interested in those. Obviously, you can you can do that, and and the way it works is that you will once you quest you you uh, check that box, and when there is a question, uh, that question will be pushed out in a notification, uh, and you'll have an opportunity to answer it. You can sort of volunteer for that question. You don't have to volunteer for it, uh, and you can choose the questions uh, that you want to take. Uh, so, and we can talk about that. It's a very attractive feature to this program. You know, uh, we were looking, uh, boy, it's been at least a year now that we've been working on this, but initially uh, I and many others were looking for a way to sort of allow us to use our uh, expertise to, to help customers, in, you know, in a pro bono way. And we, we talked about other ideas. The advantage of this is that this PBA Free Legal Answers already exists, is, is robust, has handled uh, several hundred thousand questions nationwide, uh, and allows, has a lot of uh, very salutary features to allow uh, public utility lawyers to um, uh, participate when they want to, and, and in a way that will, that will be, uh, uh, you know, provide uh, useful answers to consumers. And I think as a result, um, uh, the Consumer Advocates Office through Patrick Cicero uh, and PULS 
have both endorsed the, and supported the program. And I think that's, I mean, you know, we thank, can't thank them enough for sort of giving them their, this, the uh, seal of uh, the good housekeeping seal of approval for those of who remember that. Um, now we're, you know, in terms of participation, uh, again, we have to thank Pulp and the Public Utility uh, Legal Support Network. They're going to provide uh, a, a training. They, some of the training will be today. Uh, we'll have additional training. But in another aspect uh, that, that I think will will make this sort of uh, very uh, risk-free for you guys is that we're going to try to create an email listserv that, so that if you get a question, if you take a question and you're not sure about the answer, if you want to test the answer, you can then send that question out and your proposed answer and uh, get feedback from other people. And I think that's a, you know, a way to make sure that you feel comfortable with it. Of course, if you, if it's in an area where you're not comfortable or it specifically deals with someone for whom you have a client relationship, you can always just pass on that question. And so, uh, you know, that I think makes it attractive for um, virtually anybody who's in the public utility area. So, you know, why, what do I see? You probably can guess some of the things, but if you, next slide, please. Thanks, Liz. Liz said she wanted to be useful. So she's, and it's one of the most competent uh, slide uh, advancers we've ever had. So, uh, Here's 10 top 10 reasons to sign up. So the first reason to me is clear, and that is we get to help people. <laughs> uh, you know, I, we, there are from what the in, the discussions we've had with mostly with uh, with Liz and John and other uh, public <clears throat> uh, legal services people, they're see they they perceive a a big need for additional help in these areas. You know, they're handling lots and lots of questions like this. We become an additional uh, an additional service. Now, that's not to say that there's not a uh, very competent, very well-established uh, consumer help networks already in existence. Of course, PUC has one, uh, OCA has one, but our, uh, all the utilities have, um, um, uh, most of the utilities have, uh, uh, um, Departments that uh, a cares a cares department uh, cares groups that are try to help customers in in similar ways, um, but our view is that this would be an additional resource, and uh, it would be you know with individuals who could give uh, competent answers in a speedy way. So we really think there's a potential to provide additional assistance, and that's pretty good. Uh, the second reason, you know, again, right up on the top is that, you know, if we can help one customer identify a low income assistance program that will help them pay their bill, then to me, the entire program is worth it. Uh, you know, that, you know, there are thousands of customers that are that are struggling to pay their utility bills, utility utilities. And I represent several, but um, so I'm prejudiced, but are trying in, in, in a sincere way to get as much help to those customers, to low-income customers who can't pay as they can. There's always a gap between the number of customers that are enrolled and the number of customers that are eligible. And this is one a, another way, hopefully, to identify people and help them identify uh, programs that that could help them. And you know, if they have a problem with their electric bill, getting them into a low income assistance program for their water bill is going to help them with their electric bill because that's going to give them it's going to reduce their their responsibility for their water service and that's going to give them presumably or theoretically at least more money to pay their electric bill and the, the third reason that I came up with is that it adds to your knowledge base you know you may work in the utility area but not work specifically in these kinds of areas it gives you a chance to find out about the, these kinds of issues and to work on them, you know, and, um, you know, maybe that's helpful, you know, the next time your, your brother-in-law asks you about what to do <laughs> because they bought a bad solar system or they, they, you know, they, they got switched, uh, without their knowledge. And what I find is a lot of people are not quite sure how to handle those problems. They have a vague knowledge and having somebody who has an expertise, um, you know, really helps. You know, fourth, I just, you know, PLS is a great, a great organization. You know, it's an organization of utility lawyers. 
And, you know, this is a program they've endorsed. So if you participate in that, if you, you know, I think it helps the utility bar overall because it's a, you know, it's a positive thing that the utility bar is doing. Um, fifth, uh, you know, a little tongue in cheek, you know, another opportunity to deal with computer based programming like we don't have enough. But uh, it is kind of fun to to get on there and to utilize the the the. Uh, uh, the platform, I find, you know, I'm I'm kind of a nerd. Uh, if you did, guys didn't know, but you know, it's it. it I, I think you'll find it interesting. And the biggest thing that I found was it gives me an opportunity to to, to help people in this kind of pro uh, pro bono situation in areas that I actually feel competent in. You know, rather than trying, you know, not that it's not important to help people. Uh, <clears throat> With guardianship or with uh, some a divorce action or to to uh, to defend against a, a a credit card bill, all of which I've done, and but you know I didn't feel like I was really the best you know that I knew what I was doing in any of those instances, uh, although I muddled through. Uh, you want to advance the slide? Thanks. Um, and this is another really important one that I at least from my perspective, and that is. The vision is that we would get a, a, give us an opportunity to work in a non-adversarial context with our fellow utility lawyers in the private bar, the OCA, and we're hoping, hoping the PUC. Now, we're going to keep work with the PUC to get them comfortable with this. Obviously, it's an individual system. We have one or two utility PUC lawyers that have signed up. Uh, I personally don't see any ethical issue with a PUC lawyer signing up and trying to help answer questions is, you know, there are going to be a lot, hopefully there are going to be a lot of questions. There'll be questions that won't have any uh, conflict issues, but um, uh, you know, you're going to get a chance to interact with some of them in, in, in a variety of ways. And I think the more we uh, act, you know, you know, more we do that, the more we have those kinds of relationships um, the, the better, you know, the, the, the advancement, of, it advances goodwill, it advances a real per, a real personal relationship. And in my 47 years, I, I counted it up, of, of, of practice, I've always found that that's been, a, you know, a very positive, very positive thing. Um, it, you know, it helps get, uh, you know, reasonable results for your clients, and it helps your practice if you have a good relationship with the person on the other side. And sometimes in an adversarial relationship, it's hard to 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 get there, uh, it, admittedly. Uh, and then seven is sort of the same thing. It's uh, uh, you know uh, you know you're going to get a chance to deal with, uh, get to know PUC, PUC staff or uh, OCA staff that you may not have dealt with. And again, that's a positive thing for your other for the for your paying practice, in my opinion. And then, um, you know, it's fun to come up with, trying to come up with the answers, at least I, for me, it is. Um, and then nine, of course, is uh, the, you know, you have something to think about when your bracket, NCAA brackets going down in flames. So, uh, you know, I, obviously being facetious, but, you know, it is kind of a busman's holiday for me. I found that I enjoyed trying to answer the questions, sort of a little bit of a challenge. I don't like crossword puzzles, but I do like this. Uh, it's kind of fun. And then I did. I lied. There's only nine. So somebody else will come up with the other, the tenth re reason to sign up. I, I just, I, I would end just by asking you to give it some thought, give it some consideration. You can sign up and see how you like it. Uh, no cost obligation. <laughs> and if you act now, we'll give you a nice, a nice maker. No, just kidding. Um, all right. That's what I have. That's uh, and obviously offline. If you want to ask me any questions or today, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here and be happy to do so. Thanks, everybody. Am I to introduce Dave? Dave, I think you're next, right? I can introduce myself. I um, wanted to make sure I'm in. You're here, Dave. Okay, good. Um, so everyone, I'm delighted to be on um, this session. I'm really excited to be representing the Pennsylvania Bar in our program, the Pennsylvania Free Legal Answers here. Uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm David Keller Travaskis. I always throw my middle name in because uh, I'm named after my maternal grandfather and he's actually got a Wikipedia page. So if you're bored tonight, after you've signed up for Free Legal Answers, Google David H. Keller, and you can read about 
the stock that I came from. Um, Liz is playing the old role of being our slide person. So we have a couple fun slides. This is me and the fanatic. If we do the next slide, you see that I'm bi-coastal in Pennsylvania. That's the parrot. Um, I'm going to actually be in a school uh, next week seeing whether for Philadelphia they like the Riddy, the Fanatic, or Swoop more. And we'll do the same thing in Pittsburgh later on in the year. If you've moved the slides forward, you'll see that we have an agenda here. And you're going, everyone on the program is going to get the full PowerPoint. So some of the things I have in here, I'm just going to make quick reference to. But we're really delighted to have Utility Bar colleagues join in for this interactive webinar so that you can learn about how everybody can participate in this. We will talk a lot about the ethics of this pro bono service because there really are some major changes that have happened to our ethics codes over the years, um, certainly in this century, that have changed things so that clinics, this kind of clinical work is much easier to do and the worry about conflicts is much less unless they're an obvious conflict. And we'll have resources for you to fully engaged. So we'll be sharing those. And those resources will be placed both on the Free Legal Answers website and on some other websites available for everyone. We'll move to the next slide where we're just going to look at the parable. If you remember the parable of the blind men and the elephant, each of the blind men grabbed the elephant in a different spot. And they all had a different perspective on what was going on because of where they grabbed the elephant. This reflects really how many of the people who reach out for help um, in any area, but especially in the utility field, often feel they don't have a big view that they're dealing with an elephant. They think they're, you know, the little parts they grab, they think they've got a tail, they've got a spear. And because they're blind, they're making up different kinds of things. It doesn't add up to the sum of the whole. What we hope to do with Free Legal Answers in the utility project is to basically give them a much better view of what the whole is and give them resources to access. The next slide then goes to just the whole concept of why we do this. We do this for justice, but I have a much less noble goal, um, access to legal services, access to a lawyer even who just answers my question. That really is a lot. Um, whether or not we can actually achieve justice is something that we all want to strive for. But for most people who are really struggling, um, poor people who are struggling with legal needs, access to somebody who can point them in the right direction is really a lot. That may actually be justice here. And our next slide, we just focus on the idea that this is all our constitutional rights. I'm a civics educator at heart, so I always mention how these things, we don't guarantee all these freedoms. And we have in the criminal law area a right to counsel. We don't have any kind of similar right across the board in civil matters. But lawyers doing pro bono service can help. And that's one of the things that we want. So we'll move forward. So the preamble, we're establishing justice again. We'll move forward. These slides were a lot for you to think about. One thing I want to do talk about is the idea that we want to think about the entire system. Um, years ago, then Chief Justice Ron Castillo at a hearing supporting legal aid was talking about how we should be funding legal aid in Pennsylvania. He meant to say as a line item in our budgets, but he said as we fund roads and bridges. Now I've traveled over 2 million miles in Pennsylvania by car, so I probably wouldn't have used roads and bridges as the model for how we would want something to be fully funded. But the more that we can look out to support people in need and the more that we can support the programs that are out there that are helping poor people, the better it over is. So I always want you to think about this and I want you to think about co-production, which is the next slide. Um, the concept that the more we can do for people, obviously that's great, but the more we can help people do things for themselves, it's really much, much better. And so one of the things about the free legal answer is the give and take that you can have on it. And I'll be talking about that in a moment, but the give and take that you can have with clients on the website really may allow them to be able to find ways to not only solve their current problem, but know how to deal with their future problem. Because most people don't just have one problem and are done. Most of the people we deal with, we see um, just because life is really tough when you're poor in our nation. Move forward. So I wanted to give you a couple things just to put on your um, plate of resources. 
part of the thing I always think about is we all get asked questions from people who have needs. Um, and people, they might be, if you're a private lawyer, people coming to you for help. If you're just somebody in the community, it might be somebody who came up to you for help. And it might be, as Dan mentioned, your cousin or your uncle who just has legal needs. A lot of times we don't want to help those people and we're worried about giving um, any kind of advice that might bounce back to us um, because we're not you know, aware of how to answer questions in that particular area, or we just simply don't have the time and energy right now to devote. I love having things that allow me to say other than I can't help you. Rather, I say, I might not be able to help you, but please try this website, palawhelp.org, to see what you can do. And one of the places that we should make sure that we have good utility resources is this site. It gets over 150,000 hits from mostly clients each month. And this is something we do in cooperation with PLAN, the Pennsylvania Bar, and the National Legal Services Corporation. So we'll move forward to the next resource like this, which is probono.net, paprobono.net is a site for lawyers to sign up on where they can get access to a lot of resources if they're doing any form of pro bono in a wide range of areas. But today we're really here to talk about free legal answers. So that's what we're going to go to. And you know, how does Pennsylvania free legal answers work? It's a site based on a walk-in clinic model. And clients all over the state are given the opportunity to register and post questions. They're limited in how many questions they can post. They can't ask questions that are criminal in nature. And there is an income limitation of 250% of poverty, but that still is a lot better than what our normal 125% of poverty is for getting any kind of uh, resource from our legal aid system. The Free Legal Answers has a ton of things going for it. We did not take it on in Pennsylvania until it had been done by 42 other states and over 10 years of experience. And right now we're well over 300,000 questions that have been answered. So we have a ton of experience in this. The next slide is going to talk a little bit about um, what happened. You saw the 250% of poverty, the, they can't have any more than $5,000. Um, and we're going back, we skipped it back, Liz, you gotta go forward. Um, so clients on the platform sign an agreement. So do the lawyers on the platform. Obviously lawyers and clients are coming at this at different levels. For the lawyer, let's go to the next slide. The site um, allows the lawyer to respond to any question or close a question or leave it open for follow-up clarification and then close it. It's short-term limited representation. And obviously we want people to go to other resources if they need further representation. There is an opportunity if somebody wanted to break confidentiality, they could. And sometimes we see that when the kind of problem is such that a person says, just come talk to me or call me and I can really direct you to where you need to go. But you're allowed to interact back and forth with the client and all they know is that you're a vetted lawyer on the site. The free legal answers platform allows that back and forth and you can get clarification. I often tell the story about one representation that came off of this. Now it's an area different than utility law because that's not an area that I offer pro bono service in, but it was in an estate area, which I do a lot of work in. And it actually only came to me because a person putting the question in, they identify the question the clients do by what they think where it should go. So lawyers on the site, whenever you see something that looks like it's in the wrong place, you let us know and we move it to the proper place. And this person had put a question in saying it was a family law matter, but what had happened was her uncle had died and she had a bunch of cats she was worried about. And obviously it's an estate problem, but she didn't know how to put it. it he, uncle was family. She's having legal problems because they were foreclosing on his house. She had lived with, with him for a number of years, taking care of him, doing his checks and everything. But when she died, when he died, she had no legal uh, rights to anything. Um, she didn't know about opening up an administration. There was no will. And since she was the only heir, there was actually a brother in Australia who renounced. We were able to explain to her that she could go to the register of wills with a death certificate. She could open up letters of administration. She could 
collect the estate. And she did all those things. She did it really well. Had she lived on my side of the state, which is um, outside Philadelphia, I probably would have told her to meet me. But since she was on the western part of the state, I just gave her directions. Every time we interacted, she went ahead and did the proper thing. And let's get back to the cats, because she was so concerned with the cats. And she spent a lot of time in emails back and forth telling me about the cats. If you don't know anything about cats, 11 stray cats probably would produce about, oh, 20,000 cats within a year. And she was worried about not having housing. She wasn't really worried about herself being homeless, but she was worried about these cats being homeless because we allowed her a opportunity to be able to access the resources that she needed to resource. She now is living in a home. The cats are all taken care of. She's paying taxes. Nobody's homeless. We don't have a ton of extra cats to worry about getting um, them neutered so they don't create more cats. And just listening to the story, I hope what you thought to yourself was, my God, that's a convoluted story. And imagine what it would have been if she had called a legal aid provider and said, I need legal aid help for my cats. And she would have carried on about the cats and a poor, overworked, overburdened intake person would have had to either try to figure it all out or simply say, it sounds like we can't help you, goodbye. Um, I don't have to worry about being, well, I am overworked, but I don't have to when I'm doing my pro bono work worry about that. I'm taking the time. I'm responding back and forth. And we had a wonderful result out of this. And my hope is that people with utility law questions will have the same kind of wonderful resource. Let's go to the next slide, because there's a lot of things you should know about free legal answers. Um, one of which is, um, this is the description of the utility project. And I think we've gone through this enough that we can go to the next slide. You'll look carefully at this. Um, you should sign up for it. There is $2 million of malpractice on this site. No one knows that you're on this site except you and I will know because I register everyone for the site. You do not have to do any questions or you could do hundreds of questions. If you start to do hundreds of questions, you'll be recognized by the PBA and the ABA. Um, and we've had some articles about things like that. Once you sign up, you'll get some news about it. But if all you want to do is focus on the residential utility and energy matters, there is across the top a banner and the far right side of the banner shows, it says manage subscriptions. And when you go into that, it allows you to click on whichever kinds of subscriptions, whatever kinds of legal issues you want to be notified for. And when you click on residential utility and energy matters, what that means is that your email will get a notice when somebody's posted a question on free legal answers for you to be able to click on, go to and look at and answer it if you'd like. We have had a few answers, but right now we have more lawyers who are qualified to answer these kind of questions than we have clients who know that they can post these kind of questions here. Because of all the legal aid people who are on this call and because of the great work of Pulp, we expect that there will be a lot more people posting questions and that every lawyer who wants to do something here will be able to do it. Um, let's move forward. David, I'm sorry, this is Kelly. If I could just launch the first CLE poll. Um, Absolutely. Attorneys, this will be up for one minute. You should see the pop-up screen. Just click yes or no, and that allows me to record your response. And David, please feel free to continue. Thanks so much. Well, no, I'm, one of the things is the idea of, you know, there is no minimum or maximum you have to do. Our lawyer, goal here is for lawyers to do that at your convenience in areas of your expertise. And you can keep track of your hours. And this is something I really wanted to stress. The Pennsylvania Bar Association is a provider of CLE for pro bono service. Every lawyer in Pennsylvania, if you're working for a certified provider like the PBA, every five hours of pro bono service you give and you're keeping track on this site of your pro bono hours, how long it took you to answer the question. When you see that you have five hours, you send me an email and says, I'd like a free CLE now since I've done the five hours. Each reporting period, you can get up to three CLEs this way. So let's imagine today you've done the training, you do an hour and a half CLE that you're getting from plan. You do 15 hours on free legal answers. 
you'll get three more credits that way. And if you're a person who is involved with the PBA and a lot of things, maybe you got the urge to go out to one of our Wills for Heroes clinics. We just had one at Widener Law School. Maybe you were an alum of Widener Commonwealth Law School and you went out there and you did three hours there because that's all the time you had. Well, you could do two hours on uh, free legal answers and the three hours on the Wills for Heroes and that counts as five hours of pro bono credit so you can get your free credit. So Liz, let's do the next slide. And what else can utility lawyers do? We want you to always be concerned about um, legal services, promote access to justice, access to legal services, let others know about it. And always you can donate to legal aid. And if you don't know which legal aid to donate to, donate to the Pennsylvania Bar Foundation and put it into the pro bono office. We'll make sure that you get help there. Or what's a great thing that we do at the PBA Bar Foundation is we support the LRAP program. So by you giving a donation to the pro bono um, LRAP fund, you basically can help lawyers who are in um, justice programs get their loans paid off. Let's go to the final slides real quickly, and then we're going to shift over. I wanted to mention Edgar Kahn. Um, Edgar was a mentor of mine. If you don't know the lawyer Edgar Kahn, you should Google him. You should look him up. When you get the slide package, you can look at him. The greatest poverty lawyer of the last 60 plus years. But Edgar was a person who was a doer who started lots and lots of programs. He and his late wife, Jean Campercon. Edgar's passed too now. But they started Antioch Law School. They wrote the law review article. And let's take the next slide as I wax poetically about Edgar. They wrote the law review article in 1964, A War on Poverty, that basically got the Legal Services Corporation created. Uh, Sergeant Shriver and Bobby Kennedy, they, they worked for Bobby Kennedy, but Sergeant Shriver and Bobby Kennedy took it to Johnson. Johnson didn't want anybody to sue him, so he wasn't happy about it. But they gave the idea, which eventually Nixon would make into the Legal Services Corporation. So let's finish up our pro presentation. I'm going to pass over to um, Patrick with this, but these are all the things that are going on in pro bono. It's a delight to be with all of you. Um, Kelly, we still have the uh, results. It looks like we got 95% of the people said they were actively participating in this session and five said they were not. So Patrick, on that note, the floor is yours. Well, hopefully we can bring those numbers up in terms of those who are actively participating. Um, so um, I'm gonna go through the um, ethics portion of our time together and um, those of you who attended the Public Utility Commission's conference, I don't know, a year or so ago, uh, maybe not quite, uh, might recognize these slides. But what we're going to do is going to go through the general rules of uh, duties to current and former clients. Then we're going to go and talk about kind of the, the concomitant obligations for pro bono publico service. And then the exception to the general rules, which we at least I and everybody on this call really thinks free legal answers fits into um, and why that's important. But before I go through um, this in detail, I just wanna reinforce a couple of things that Dan and David said, and I know John's gonna get to the substantive specifics um, after I'm finished. But you know, I've answered a number of, of questions on free legal answers, both in the utility space and some other spaces. You know, and the vast majority of these are questions that all of the folks who are familiar with public utility law who work at the commission for utility, um, for private law firm representing utilities and certainly in legal services kind of should be able to answer um, pretty readily. And I think that it's important to understand there are things like, um, uh, I haven't gotten my bill in the last uh, two months, what do I do? Um, and, you know, it's it's simple things that are encouraging people to, at first, reach out to their utility company, and second, understand that they might have rights under the public utility code, that if their public utility company can't help them or doesn't provide them the answers they want, referring them um, to the Bureau of Consumer Services um, for purposes of knowing their rights about this. 
I have not, not had in the context of the of the time that I've been answering questions on free legal answers, anyone even specifically identifying their utility other than whether it's a gas or water or electric utility. Um, and I mentioned that because when we get to this exception about this, this rule, there's gonna be some really important language here about whether attorneys actually know that a conflict, conflict exists. So I'll come back to that um, here in a moment. Um, the other thing I wanna mention is the, is the um, uh, part that uh, David talked about uh, real briefly, which is kind of the confidentiality inherent um, in this, um, you don't have to be worried that when you're answering this question that this person's going to look you up on the internet, find you, and then you know demand more legal services from you in some way, shape, or form. Right? Um, the the way this works is that they know that you are an attorney licensed in Pennsylvania, um, and we'll get to the duty of competence uh, at kind of the end of my slide presentation. But that you're asserting yourself to have some knowledge and competence in this issue on in this area and that you provided them with information. Only if you want to, because you're a private practitioner and you think you could provide you know, more services to this person in a pro bono way, um, do you have to say, hey, you know, give me a call or send me an email or we can chat more. Um, but you know, I think that's really important for most of us or many of us because we don't necessarily um, want that follow-up, um, at least in the context of answering questions like this. So. I'm gonna talk about the general rules first. Um, then I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, an exception to that general rule, which I think really squarely uh, free legal answers fits into. So let's talk about um, PA rules of professional conduct 1.7. Um, all of us know that we have duties um, to avoid conflicts of interest um, to our current clients. Um, and 1.7a talks about um, the, the duty that we have to current clients, whether those current clients are governmental clients, you know, for me at the Office of Consumer Advocate um, um, or at the Public Utility Commission or their private clients, um, whether it's legal, in legal aid and or in the context of private practice. That, you know, the general rule is with the exception of that, which is provided in, in paragraph B, which we'll get to, get to here in a moment, um, a lawyer shall not represent a client if that representation involves a, con a concurrent conflict of interest. Um, and that exists under two circumstances. Uh, the representation of one client will be directly adverse to another client, or there is a significant risk of the representation of one or more clients will, mat will materially limit the lawyer's responsibilities to another client, a former client or a third person or by a personal interest of that lawyer, right? So you have some personal embedded interest, you have a former client that, for which your representation of this client would be materially adverse, or you have another client. And the thing I wanna focus on with, with rule uh, 1.7A1 is, even if you are in private practice and you represent um, electric utility one, two, three, and the person identifies that um, uh, they are a customer of electric utility one, two, three. If the, if the question that they're asking would not create a direct adverse relationship, um, you may well be able to nevertheless provide them with information. We'll get to that in a moment um, as we talk through this. Next slide, please, Liz. Um, so what are, the, what are the general exceptions? Right, oh, 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 I, I don't know, you think you went too many. Yep, there, 1.7b, thank you. Um, what are the general exceptions um, to 1.7a? Uh, 1.7b um, says, even if there's a concurrent conflict, you may represent this client under a couple of circumstances. Um, a, you're gonna be able to provide competent and diligent representation to an affected client. B, the representation isn't prohibited by law. C, um, it does not involve an assertion of a claim by one client against the, the other in the same litigation or proceeding before a tribunal. And D, um, each affected client gives their informed consent. So you can conceive of a scenario where you have really specialized knowledge and this question is one of really specialized knowledge um, and that you represent a utility, right, in private practice. And that utility has said, yes, for purposes of free legal answers, you know, you may answer questions that our customers have. And then you get the consent of the person affected by the question and say, you know, although, you know, it 
then and and you make a determination there's not a um adverse relationship they're not see, they're not filing a claim as against the person but you're providing information and advice um about how they can proceed you can proceed even if you have a known conflict of interest even if you know that that is a known conflict of interest if you meet all of the criteria under 1.7 b1 through 4 um the other important thing that david and dan both mentioned is the beauty of free legal answers is you don't have to answer the question. So if you represent a particular um, utility um, and the question that comes up clearly involves that utility, because there are other people in the queue who also will be getting that question, they might not have a conflict at all in answering that question. And so you can kick it to them or you can say, I'm not gonna answer this one because it involves a utility that I represent. That is fine too. And it's unlike a regular walk-in clinic, you don't have to kind of excuse yourself in front of that person and say, I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer this question. The person doesn't even know um, that you are kind of uh, looking at the question and passing on it. There will be opportunities to kick this to other people. Um, all right, Liz, next slide, please. So in addition to um, 1.7, professional rules, of, uh, PA rules of professional conduct 1.8, deals with uh, very specific um, rules about using information that you have from one client um, for the help of another. So even if you determine that um, it's not a conflict of interest for you to represent or give advice to um, somebody in the context of the free legal answers, uh, the rules prevent us from using information we gain from client A um, to benefit client B if that use of that information is to the detriment of, of you know, client A, right? So I wanna, I have highlighted the, the highlights here in the comment are mine, right? Um, the general rule again is that a lawyer shall not use information relating to the representation of a client to the disadvantage of that client, unless the client gives informed consent, consent except as permitted by these rules. And one of the comments um, about the use of information related to representation says, it does not prohibit uses that do not disadvantage the client. Um, and that paragraph B, it only prohibits disadvantageous use of client information unless the client gives informed consent. So think of a, an example, a very clear example in the world where we work. Um, it's not a disadvantage in my judgment for you to talk about how somebody can enroll in the CAP program, right? Um, it's not a disadvantage for you to um, tell somebody to call their utility and reach out to them and ask them about their customer assistance program or to call the utility and ask them about a payment arrangement. That is not using information you have um, to disadvantage the client. And if you have some very specific information, again, if you represent utility one, two, three, and you know very specific information about utility one, two, threes, um, customer assistance program or the way their payment arrangements work, um, giving that information to the client um, very likely, in my judgment, does not violate this rule because even though you have specialized knowledge about this, it doesn't it doesn't violate the rule. What might come into play here is if you know exactly how their dispute processes work. Um, probably giving that information to a person about how they can ask specific questions because of how their dispute processes work. That is the kind of thing that if you want to do that, um, you would have to get informed consent of your then current client, in this case, utility one, two, three, in order to do that. And that utility may say, yes, please do, because we want people to know this information. Or they may say, no, please don't. Um, because this is information that, you know, we hold close to the vest for whatever reason. Again, um, your ability to participate in this should not be, um, um, in, in, P, in PA free legal answers generally, should not be put to the side because you're afraid that that might happen. Because if that situation, that scenario presents itself, that's a question you can pass on. You don't have to answer that question. But I highlight rule 1.8b, because um, we all have information and knowledge about our current clients. Um, some of that would work to their disadvantage and we have an ethical obligation to protect that. We don't have an ethical obligation and it's not a conflict of interest um, if um, it doesn't work to their disadvantage, if it doesn't disadvantage the client. 
getting customers who are behind on their bills and enrolled in a customer assistance program or giving them information about how they should call or reach out to their utility doesn't disadvantage your current client um, if you happen to represent that, uh, the client who is, a, who is a utility. I would also say for, for governmental officials, those who work at certainly my office, um, maybe the Small Business Advocates Office, um, or within the Public Utility Commission itself, um, I also don't think it works to the disadvantage of your institutional client, um, the Public Utility Commission um, itself, if you work at the commission, to talk about the rules and processes for things like the CAP program or informal or formal complaint processes. Again, if you start talking about things like the way the commission has ruled on certain cases or their internal operating procedures, that's where you begin to think about, you know, uh, those are things that you are likely not going to be able to or want to do um, based on 1.8. But talking about people's rights to file an informal complaint or their right um, and what the process looks like for a formal informal complaint, those are things that likely don't um, uh, cross the line, at least in my judgment. Okay, um, next slide, please. Um, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, uh, duties to former clients. Liz, next slide, please. Um, somebody have to tell me, I can't, I can't, what I see still is 1.8 on my, on my, um, um, slide deck. Um, I need to see the next slide, which is 1.9. That's what I see too, Patrick. And I'm trying to see if there's any way I can, but I think since Liz is sharing her screen, I can't take over. All right. Well, um, maybe we'll get caught up. I'm not sure, um, what uh, technical problems we're having, but uh, rule 1.9, um, when we can get there, um, is duties to former clients. Um, and um, uh, duties to former clients um, talk about when a, a lawyer who has formally represented uh, a client in a matter, they shall not thereafter um, represent another person in the same or substantially related matter um, in which that person's interests are materially adverse. So you shall not knowingly represent a person in the same or substantial matter if that's if it's adverse. So you can't, you know, again, in the context of representing utility, um, represent utility one, two, three in a matter, and then go out and represent um, a client, uh, an individual client or an institutional client in a matter that is materially adverse. And I know we also have um, um, folks on this call who represent other actors in our institutional space that may or may not be utilities. They may be institutional you know, uh, corporations who participate in uh, matters before the Public Utility Commission, I would say very rarely on free legal answers are you going to run into a problem um, where those um, folks are um, presenting a conflict of interest. Those are judgments that you're going to have to make um, by your by yourself. But again, with as with current clients, with former clients, um, uh, you can't um, represent uh, where there's direct uh, conflict. Um, unless that former client gives um, informed consent. Um, that's under uh, uh, professional rules, PA rules of professional conduct 1.9a and b. Um, and then there's also PA rules of professional conduct um, uh, 1.9c as in CAT, um, where um, um, again, it's it's the equivalent to the 1.8 that you can't use information, um, that is materially adverse to another client that you've gained during the course of the representation. Same kind of comment exists um, in that context, which is it has to be materially adverse, it has to uh, materially disadvantage that client. Um, and so um, looks like we're back, Liz, we want to go to the next slide. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, has to materially disadvantage that client. So it's the same kind of duties that um, had existed under, under 1.8. Okay, let's talk about what I think is the fun part now. I mean, not that the conflict of interest of current clients and uh, former clients is not fun, um, but I think we all know that we have to avoid those. Um, and I wanna talk about how that all intersects with what we're talking about with free legal answers, unlike regular, what I call regular pro bono um, or uh, public representation. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So um, under our rules of professional conduct, 
um, we have Rule 6.1. Um, and Rule 6.1 um, is kind of an imperative, a should, it's not a must, it's not a, it's not a shall, um, but it, it kind of compels us as a part of our duties as lawyers, as representatives of the public trust, as members of the bar, to render public interest legal services. Um, and you can discharge this duty um, in a variety of ways, one of which is to provide um, services at no fee or reduced fee to persons um, of limited means or to public service or charitable organizations. Um, you can also do it by uh, engaging in activities that improve the law, right? Um, kind of reform activities, the legal system or the legal profession, or you can support organizations that provide legal services to persons of limited means. So, you know, all of us go through various phases in our life where we have sometimes more time and sometimes more money. Um, so if you're one of those places in your life where you have less time but more money, please donate to Legal Aid. Um, and, you know, in addition to the, to the um, organizations and entities that um, you all know um, out there, you can visit the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network's website and you can donate to Plan itself, or you can get the list of all of the local legal aid offices and the specialized legal aid offices that do work within the plan network, or there's also many other nonprofit organizations that do really good work that, you know, are kind of uh, uh, parallel cousin agencies to the, the legal aid system. But if you have time, right, and again, one of the benefits of Free Legal Answers is that you can answer this question at 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. or midnight, right? Um, you can, you get the email, you check in on it, um, it's not bounded by necessarily your work hours, and it provides really, really meaningful information to people who are struggling and don't know where else to turn to get questions. And so you can satisfy your ethical obligations under Rule 6.1 um, by participating in PBA's Free Legal Answers. You can also satisfy it by um, doing a custody clinic or doing some other um, representation for a local legal aid office, all of which is good. And I by no means want to detract from the very real importance of doing um, pro bono publico um, uh, representation outside of the context of free legal answers. But it is a way for you to kind of help um, kind of scratch this itch. So if you can go to the next slide, I want to focus on the comment. Um, this is the comment to rule 6.1. Um, and I, again, these highlights are mine. Right. Um, it does. It is a, kind of a, a sense in which every lawyer, regardless of whether or not you're at the height of your career or you're just beginning your career, regardless of how overworked you feel, um, you should um, find time to participate or otherwise support the provision of legal services. Again, sometimes in our lives we have more time than money and sometimes we have more money than time. Um, I would urge you to find that balance, um, but um, all of us are called to participate. Um, so this is kind of the imperative associated with Rule 6.1 under the comment. Um, and, you know, it really is incumbent on all of us um, to kind of do our part in this regard. All right, let's talk about Rule 6.5. Next slide, please. So under Rule 6.5, um, this is where I think the major exception comes in to those rules under 1.7, 1.8, and 1.9 come into play, as well as 1.10. And we didn't talk about 1.10. That's imputed conflicts of interest. Those are the interests that if your firm has a conflict, but you yourself as a lawyer don't have a conflict. We'll touch on that briefly here in a moment. Um, but Rule 6.5 is a really important rule that um, our Supreme Court has passed um, for nonprofit and court-appointed limited legal services programs. And that's what PBA Free Legal Services Free legal answers is. So a lawyer who, under the auspices of a program sponsored by a nonprofit organization or court, here the PBA as a nonprofit organization, provides short-term limited legal services to a client without expectation by either the client or the, um, either the lawyer or the client that the lawyer will provide continuing representation to the client. And that's really important. So here under free legal answers, this is not long-term representation. This is short-term representation. You're answering a question. There's no expectation that you go on to represent that client in any further legal matter. What Free Legal Answers is, is the opportunity for, for the most part, for a lawyer to be a counselor 
as opposed to an advocate. And we have both of these roles, a counselor guiding the person and giving them advice and information about what might help them solve their problem, as opposed to representing that person in court or before the Public Utility Commission as an advocate. So PBA Free Legal Answers is lawyer as counselor. It could, as David and Dan mentioned, you know, if you really say, I want to take this thing and there's no conflict that you have, you could offline and off the off the context of free legal answers represent that person in any variety of capacities as a pro bono attorney. There is no expectation that you do that. And that is outside the confines of what free legal answers is. So under free legal answers, it is short term representation, providing information and advice um, um, about what the person's legal problem is. Um, that neither you nor they have an expectation will continue beyond that. Um, that and it's held under the auspices of the Pennsylvania Bar Association and the American Bar Association. All lawyers who participate, as David mentioned, are covered by the malpractice insurance that is under the umbrella of Free Legal Answers. And if you haven't visited the site, there's really important information on there about how that works and what that does. So you don't have to worry about kind of that level of coverage, either under your firm's coverage or your personal coverage. So this checks that box. And so what does that get you? If you go to the next slide, I'll show you what that means when you're covered under uh, Rule 6.5. When you're covered under Rule 6.5, um, um, what that means is um, that you're subject to Rules 1.7 and 1.9, meaning those rules about conflicts of interest, only if the lawyer knows that the representation of a client involves a conflict of interest. So what that means is, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, a lot of these questions that come up, the person doesn't identify who the utility is in question. They might say it's an electric utility or a gas utility or a water utility. Um, if they say that under these auspices, it's my view that 6.5 protects all of the attorneys um, who might represent utility one, two, three, if they don't know that utility one, two, three is the electric utility that is being talked about. You can then say, okay, so you have a problem with you're facing a shutoff of your electric utility. You can give them a litany of kind of things that you can go through. Make sure you reach out to your lawyer. If you're low income, right, which you are because you're under the uh, free legal answers, you may or may not qualify depending on the rules of that utility for their customer assistance program, but that might be an area that you wanna go into. You may wanna talk about their rights and responsibilities in terms of uh, um, contacting their utility first, asking about a payment arrangement or about weatherization assistance programs. Um, you would talk about their rights if they identify themselves as a victim of domestic violence um, to the additional rules that are under there. But if you don't know who the utility is they're talking about, you only know it's an electric or water or wastewater utility, um, rule 6.5 covers you and that um, uh, from former or current clients under 1.7 and 1.9. The same um, is 1.10. 1.10, um, again, we didn't go over that rule, but it's about imputed conflicts of interest. And it's only if the lawyer knows that another lawyer associated with the firm is disqualified under 1.7 or 1.9 does that, um, again, trigger. Um, and then again, um, uh, the imputed conflicts of interest don't don't happen, they don't exist um, under um, 6.5 B as in boy, unless the lawyer representing the person knows that there is an imputed conflict of interest. So it kind of provides this safe harbor. 6.5 is a safe harbor for these limited legal representation um, uh, 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 opportunities of which free legal answers is one um, and allows you to, to only be responsible for that which you know, right? Otherwise, in the context of representing clients, you have a duty to kind of ask and figure out whether that conflict exists. That same duty doesn't necessarily exist here if you're providing um, information in this context. Of course, if you know that a conflict exists because the person identifies that they're a, a, a client of utility one, two, three, then 1 1.7 and 1.9 um, and 1.10 happen, exist, um, and you have to go through those that framework that we talked about at the beginning of my presentation. All right, I want to talk briefly about a couple other rules that are that are in play here. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, and those are 1.1, 1.4, and 1.6. 
these exist irrespective of whether you're participating in free legal answers or not, right? These are kind of just rules of professional um, responsibility. One is competence, right? So you have to have the legal knowledge, skill, thoroughness, and preparation necessary to answer these questions. Um, we're going to talk, John's going to go through some training here about some of this information. The slides are going to go out. One of the things about this is, um, as, as Dan mentioned, it's an opportunity for us to all collaborate on some of this. We are putting up some resources. We're going to be putting up some resources on free legal answers about how to direct people. There's going to be ongoing opportunities for training about how to do some of this. That really provides the basis of competence. I would say, though, any lawyer on this call who works within the public utility space is going to be competent to answer the vast majority of questions that are coming up on the residential utility matters um, part of free legal answers. And again, if you're not, you can say, I just don't feel comfortable answering that question. I'm going to pass that along or make sure that somebody else gets to answer it. You don't have an obligation to do so. The second one is communication. Um, we all have a duty to communicate clearly to clients, whether it's clients who are, who are limited in representation or clients who are long-term representation. And we all know that that duty, um, how clear communication happens, ebbs and flows depending on who we're talking to. Um, you may talk to a uh, you know, CEO of a corporation or the, the, you know, your uh, supervisor in the context of your governmental uh, responsibilities differently than you're talking to a member of the public who knows little about this. And so when you're giving answers back, it's really important to use clear, plain language and not jargon. And any jargon you do use, like cap or liar, that you explain. So again, when you um, give information back to somebody, you may want to tell them what the jargon is that they have to use to the utility, but you need to have a, a, an obligation to explain what those things are um, so that the person understands that you're not just speaking gibberish, you're actually talking about utility speak, um, and that utility speak translates into something um, in this world. Um, and then again, confidentiality, right? Um, uh, this is a platform where people are putting stuff out and so all the lawyers on the platform can see it. Um, but um, to the extent that the person reveals private information um, or confidential information, um, you know, uh, this is not stuff that you use as an example for everybody else, right? Um, so it's, it's the response to the platform is seen by the client, the lawyer who takes the question, um, and not others, right? Um, it's not, you know, broadcast to other users. It's not out there for everybody and always. And again, you have an obligation um, to maintain confidentiality with these clients and every other client. All right, so I breeze through all that quickly. Um, there may inevitably be questions that come up, happy to answer them as we move through. Um, but now I want to, we want to spend the last, you know, 15, 20 minutes or so letting John um, and Liz talk about some of the substance of issues that may arise. Okay, John. Thank you, Patrick. Um, I'm John Sweet. I'm the senior attorney at the Pennsylvania, senior staff attorney at the Pennsylvania Utilities Law Project. Uh, it's a statewide legal aid organization that specializes in utility matters affecting uh, low income consumers. Uh, and, and what I want to do now is provide a brief overview of uh, various resources and guidance that are available for some of the most common questions that we run into as advocates. Um, I want to lead off by just letting you know that there's a lot of information on these slides, uh, and I won't be getting to every single point on the slides. Uh, the point is that you can, in the future, come back to these slides, use them as a resource. Um, as the program progresses, we're going to be developing a resource guide and, and some additional trainings. Um, but this will at least give you a head start on um, knowing where to look. Um, next slide, please. Um, so also to start off, the uh, we want to use this time to or use this as, this program as a resource, both for uh, the public utility law section pro bono program. Uh, uh, participants to be able to use the legal aid offices as a resource and also for the legal aid offices to be able to use the uh, pro bono program as a resource. So here is a list of all of the 
regional legal aid programs. Uh, they're divided by county. Uh, so if you are a pro bono attorney um, and you are reviewing the question, you think this is this is a matter that that this person is uh, qualified for a legal aid attorney and is in is in need of actual representation that you should refer them to the local legal aid program in their county. Uh, you can identify the programs either through the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network um, and also Northwest, sorry, apparently we left uh, Northwestern Legal Services uh, should also be on this list. Uh, but you should be able to uh, access their the county map on the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network website. You can also search by county on the PA Law Health website. Um, uh, and a note for legal aid attorneys too, that this pro, the PBA pro bono program is not designed to stand in the place of, uh, that, that pulp uh, uh, stands in as providing consultations for legal aid attorneys on, on clients that you currently have. Um, if you have complex legal aid, uh, complex utility law question, you should still continue to reach out to us for, for consultation. Um, Next slide, please. So and these are the list of all of the various, uh, some of the various topics and uh, areas of practice for that the legal aid programs handle. Um, utility law really overlaps with nearly all of these various uh, areas of practice. The most common overlap that we see has to do with evictions and foreclosures, where people are either being evicted because their their utility service is terminated, um, or they're going for, for through a foreclosure process. And there's liens against the property for municipal utility debt, uh, but it also comes into play in custody. People are at risk of losing their children because their utilities are are disconnected. Uh, domestic violence issues. The uh, abusers often use utility service as a, a way to manipulate their victims. Uh, and consumer and bankruptcy, a you know, big overlap there. Um, and, and both uh, in Chapter Seven, uh, you, Chapter Seven bankruptcies that can be used to uh, to address unsecured utility debt, and in Chapter Thirteen where uh, secured debt issues may come up. Uh, next slide, please. These are the specialty legal services programs. Um, and these are in place to address specific needs, uh, specific areas of need that are um, unique to these programs. Uh, outside of, of the, the areas that are typically handled by the local programs. Um, first on the list of resources, right, is the pulp. Um, and so we'll be sort of the main the main resource among the specialty legal services projects. But you may, you know, in, in answering a pro bono question, it's not a, it's often not just a straightforward utility issue. There, there's going to be multiple issues involved and um, you may need to refer them to some of the specialty legal aid programs. The, the one um, that we run into the most, I think you may wind up utilizing the most would be the Community Justice Project, uh, where they they handle uh, some uh, municipal water issues and specifically an issue that comes up a lot among low-income consumers is mobile home park water issues, which are outside the purview of utility law. Uh, for the most part, there is there are some uh, statutes related to the provision of the resale where mobile home parks will, will buy utility service and then sell it to their uh, tenants. Um, and so the, the public utility code will come into play there. But uh, a lot of a lot of this comes into um, uh, landlord tenant matters. Next slide, please. Um, some other uh, resources here, right? Pro se legal assistance. Dave, Dave um, already gave the overview of the, the PA Law Help website, but that 
uh, that can be a source for you to, to not only send people, but you can go on there and, and uh, look up certain uh, questions yourself. Uh, specifically, right, if you're, if you're looking, if you need a quick way to find uh, which legal aid programs you can refer people to, uh, you can access, you, you can plug in their county and then PA Law Help website, and it'll tell you where, what their local, uh, local legal aid offices and how to contact them. Um, also for domestic violence issues, uh, there's PA, PCADV, uh, and for uh, senior citizen issues and um, specific disability issues, uh, we have senior law, senior law and disability rights, Pennsylvania. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so utility access is a legal issue, right? Uh, I think. Most of us are, are familiar with um, that uh, utility consumers have uh, due process rights when it comes to um, notice and termination and dispute. Um, the most common questions that I'm going to run through, but this is kind of an outline of, of where we're going, um, tenant protections, universal service programs um, that, that help uh, low in, provide assistance to low-income customers, Who's liable for certain debts? Uh, how long can a utility collect on a debt or terminate for a certain debt? Uh, what are the payment arrangement standards? When can you get a payment arrangement from the utility? When do you when can you get a uh, payment arrangement from the public utility commission? Um, we get a lot of metering issue complaints. Um, we also, you know, recently there's been some rebilling issues where. Uh, Customers don't receive a bill for a while, and um, and then they get you know a bill at the end, a bill after a couple months that has uh, multiple months of late fees accrued, or you have um, issues where you have estimated readings over a period of time, and then you get a actual reading that corrects, uh, and the adjustment is something more than what the, the customer can either handle or what they expected, uh, and and we'll talk a little bit about, about the uh, the. Public Utility Commission's informal and formal complaint processes. Uh, next slide, please. So the most common laws and regulations that come into play here are uh, come up in <clears throat> Chapter 14 of the Public Utility Code, which uh, and Chapter 56, which are the regulations that are promulgated under the Chapter 14. Uh, this is where you find most of the consumer rights and protections, uh, specifically like the the notice, uh, you know, notice regulations, uh, uh, medical certificates, domestic violence protection, the winter termination moratorium. Uh, chapter fifteen, subchapter B, is the discontinuance of service to lease premises act, uh, and it has a that which is. Uh, applies to public utilities that are regulated by the Public Utility Commission as a sister statute, the Utility Services Tenants Rights Act, which applies to uh, municipal utilities and municipal authorities. Uh, both of those, uh, we'll get to in a later slide, they, they provide specific uh, protections to tenants where the bill is in the landlord's name. Um, then we also have the Choice and Competition Act, which is where you will go to look for information uh, when you're facing supplier issues. Uh, they also have uh, some language about the universal service programs and, and how those are, are set up. Um, and then finally, the Water Services Act is a, is a narrow statute specifically uh, addresses uh, situations where the water service is going to be terminated at the request of the uh, sewer utility for non-payment sewer bill. If I could just interrupt, this is Kelly. I'm, for the attorneys, I'm going to launch the second CLE poll. It will be up for one minute. And John, please feel free to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we have the next slide? Um, so here's the, you know, the, when you're presented with a, a customer um, or a, you know, a, a consumer who's facing utility termination, uh, 
the the first couple steps, the first questions that you want to ask, right? Is this person even uh, even responsible for the debt? Um, and and you're going to want to contact the utility uh, and see what what the utility can do to help uh, help stop the what? Sorry, <clears throat> contact the utility. Um, see what if you can interact, if you can work with the utility to stop the termination um, and, and give them an opportunity to resolve the dispute. Um, ensure that they are responsible for the bill. Um, so again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about situations uh, specifically addressing tenants who uh, have the utility bill in the landlord's name. Um, but also, and, and also, right, domestic violence victims who uh, have a PFA or a court order or no, uh, can't be held responsible for the for bill that was accrued in someone else's name. Um, and then C, can this issue be alleviated by enrolling the customer in a customer assistance program? If it's, if it's simply a uh, overdue bill and, and person is income eligible and hasn't been enrolled before, you can simply you know, refer them, they can they can enroll, the, the debt will be frozen, uh, and they can they can earn career forgiveness there. Uh, you can braid those and you can braid multiple programs, right? There's also federal assistance through LIHEAP um, and, and work uh, comprehensively to uh, combine whatever sources of assistance are available to see if you can address that debt. Uh, beyond that, right, you can negotiate a payment agreement. You can uh, negotiate with the utility if the customer is unable to afford the the arrangement that was offered by the utility. They also have the right to seek one PUC payment arrangement directly uh, through the the PUC, the Pennsylvania Utility Commission's informal complaint process. Um, medical certificates. Uh, I'll right for uh, customers with serious illness uh, or medical issues. Uh, I'll address that more specifically later. Uh, and the PC PC dispute process, which is also um, uh, aside from requesting payment arrangements, right? If you have an actual dispute with the utility, you can uh, file an informal complaint with the PUC, uh, which can then be appealed to a formal complaint uh, if it's if it's unresolved. Next slide, please. Uh, so tenant protections where the bill is in the landlord's name. This is where the uh, Discontinuance of Service Lease Premises Act and the Utility Service Tenants Rights Act come into play. Uh, if the bill is in the landlord's name and the landlord stops paying, uh, the, the tenant may not even know that the bill was overdue. Uh, even if they're paying the money to the landlord and then that landlord is supposed to be sending the money on to the utility, sometimes it just it doesn't happen. Uh, uh, so they have these customers have the right to 30 days notice for termination. Um, and during that 30 days, they have the right to pay, to come up with the money to pay the just the uh, previous month's amount due and to continue to pay every 30 days that previous, that the previous 30, 30 days amount due and continue service. They could continue uh, to make those payments. Uh, they can't be forced to put the bill into their name to continue service, though they do have the right to uh, have the have the specific right to put the bill in their name. So it's the it's actually the consumer's choice whether they want to just make payments ongoing or just put the put the service um, in their name. There, there's a lot of different factors that go into why a tenant would choose to um, to keep the bill in the landlord's name and make the payment versus uh, just switching in their name. I don't have time to really go specifically into what those details are. It's just important to know that it's the consumer's choice. Uh, the other, another 
factor here is the uh, the landlord cannot contact the utility uh, and request that service be terminated to the tenant as a way to uh, circumvent the eviction process. Uh, this basically would be the same thing as the landlord going down in the basement and and switching off the, the meter, right? This is a, it would constitute an illegal lockout. And if a utility goes, goes along with this, right, they're basically a party to the to the constructive eviction. Um, so to prevent that from happening, utilities before utility can terminate to a tenant household at the request of the landlord. They have to uh, obtain a notarized document swearing under uh, penalty of law that the unit is unoccupied. Uh, if they terminate and then they subsequently find out the unit was unoccupied, uh, they need to reconnect. Likewise, if they terminate a, uh, a unit um, thinking it's the landlord and they find out there is actually a tenant in that unit, they should be turning it on and providing that tenant 30 days notice um, uh, and giving them a chance to uh, come up with the amounts needed under um, under the Ustra PSL. Uh, next slide, please. So here's more uh, another issue that comes up for tenants is foreign load. This is where the uh, the bill is actually in the tenant's name, and it turns out that the tenant is paying uh, either for part of another unit or for the common areas. In those situations, the utility should be switching the entire balance in, back into the landlord's name until the foreign load is corrected. Um, at which point they will they can switch it back into the tenant's name with a zero balance and give them a fresh start moving forward. Uh, next slide, please. John, we're at two minutes. I'm going to move us ahead to the resources. <clears throat> okay. Um, for some of the programs that are available to low-income customers, there's uh, CAP, hardship funds, uh, low-income usage reduction programs, and the CARES program. Next slide. Uh, customer assistance programs provide a discounted bill to the customer and also uh, freezes their arrearage and lets them and gives them uh, arrearage forgiveness over a period of time as long as they continue to make payments uh, on that. Discounted bill, which is, helps them get out faster. Uh, hardship funds can be used uh, $500 to $600 to uh, help resolve termination issues. It can be combined with other sources. Um, and they typically have a little bit higher income um, threshold and, then, and sometimes have some uh, good faith payment uh, uh, requirements. Uh, LIHEAP is a federally funded uh, utility assistance program. Uh, they provide uh, cash and crisis grants, uh, and as well as a crisis interface program that, pro that uh, repairs uh, broken and inoperable uh, heating sources. Next slide. Um, LIHEAP cash grant, it uh, basically is a it's a grant, like straight up grant that goes to the customer that, can, that pays their their bill going forward crisis is something similar to the hardship fund can be combined with the hardship fund uh, to pay for the back balance. Um, the weatherization assistance program provides free weatherization to low income customers um, and is often coordinated with the low income usage reduction program, which is a, another uh, utility run low income weatherization program. Uh, here's a list of additional resources. Um, uh, with links, so you can go straight in, uh, find out, right? So these are links to uh, utility uh, program information on the PUC's website, the LIHEAP state plan, uh, contacts for you for, through the OCA's website uh, for how to contact the Universal Service Administrators of the various utilities, uh, and a link to the actual Universal Service plan on the PUC's website where you can find out the details of the plan. If you have any questions, please uh, reach out to, 
to uh, hold at the uh, PA utility log project dot org. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone for being here with us. Patrick, did you want to say anything else? No, I was just coming on camera. In case okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks to all the presenters for being here with us today and sharing this great information. And I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Thanks. Thank you.